So the, 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 the first bit of, of this next section it is around the legislative, the legislative landscape uh, around safeguarding, and, and it's great that we've got Kenny here with us this morning. And uh, reading Kenny's biography, short biography yesterday with, with, with some you know, real awe about, about the journey that, that you've been on yourself in, in your career, uh, uh, that uh, Kenny started off his, his NHS career back in 1980, working in the laundry section of, of a mental health unit. Uh, and then uh, went on to become a nursing assistant and then went on to become a nurse and then went on to become a midwife and, and has now uh, gone on in the, uh, the vocation around safeguarding. Um, and he, he is the head man for this uh, and it, it's an absolute privilege for us to welcome you on stage, Kenny. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I don't know about head man. I'm, uh, people say, what do you do as a head of safeguarding? So I've been in post for 154 days. I think my 150 days is better than Trump's. I think you'll agree uh, what, with what I'm going to share with you. I, I don't want to talk about legislation because I'm genuinely going to talk to you, not as a clinician, not even as a carer, I'm going to talk to you as a citizen. Every one of us in this room, in the turn of a pound coin, can be safeguarding or safeguarded. And that's what I've come to learn in my first 153 days, is no one in this room should be under any misapprehension about what safeguarding is and what safeguarding isn't. It is my job to be your listener. It is my job, as you listen to the types of victims that you'll come across in safeguarding realms, what I'd ask you is to remember a mantra that I, I learned a long time ago working in forensic mental health, um, is listen, believe, and do something. If all you take away from today... So, hands up the clinicians. A little bit of mobility. Hands up the clinicians amongst you. Good. Hands up those carers, particularly unpaid carers at home. Yes, I'm a dementia carer at home for my neighbour. Well done, you. Uh, excellent. Hands up the system leaders. Can every clinician put your hand up? You are a system leader. <laughs> every clinician put your hand up. You are a system leader. But more importantly, every one of us is a, is, is a citizen. I don't even want to talk about legislation. I'm going to take the reforms and make reality of them, okay? My job today is to show you how lack of scariness there is about safeguarding legislation because it is about reforms to reality and making it real, okay? Next slide. Oh, do I slide myself, okay? I'm, I'm a nurse, I can do this. <laughs> so NHS, first of all, you don't see any particular brand in there. My job is to listen for all NHS organisations. I represent NHS England, I represent NHS Improvement, and I also represent Public Health England and Health uh, Education England. It is my job to come to your forums, to come to your groups, to go to safeguarding boards, to listen to the lived experience. There's no more powerful for us as as people to listen to lived experience and then take it back to the national safeguarding team to see what we can do. We have working groups, we have networks, we have task and finish groups, well governed. And you'll see at the top of our task and finish groups, we actively listen to recommendations from the independent inquiry. We have a mandate to do so. The government has issued through the Secretary of State a mandate on NHS England and NHS Improvement Chief Nurse, and someone like me reports direct to her. It is our job to listen to you as clinicians. It is our job to listen to you as carers. It is our job to listen to you. What we do need from this is a bit more clinical input from you. So anyone who is a champion, please begin contacting us because we want you to shape what happens in your local environment. Whether it's a trust, 
a community organisation or the new bigger <coughs> footprints around clinical commissioning groups and integrated care. We, we deliberately set up working groups around the legislation or the reforms and you'll see there several new reforms coming out. Particularly important and linked to child abuse is the exploitation agenda. It is absolutely categorically a fact that the abuse, the sexual abuse that you heard about from the lived experience starts with an exploitative relationship in families. And we as clinicians, we as citizens need to have a brave, curious conversation that safeguarding needs to happen in families. Whilst you protect the citizen, system leaders, we need to begin having a conversation about safeguarding in families and safeguarding in communities. And we'll come on to that more. Prevent is also on, on the rise as an agenda. That's the anti-radicalization. And that does not mean Muslim radicalization. 93% of radicalization at the moment, and particularly in the North, is about right-wing politics. So we must be conscious and cognizant to the fact that with the advent of social media, the rise of prevent radicalization is high in our agenda. We have youths and teenagers going to Syria and doing nasty, horrible things to each other because vulnerable people have been picked on, usually via social media. So prevent is absolutely critical. But one of the seminal moments for you as practitioners and system leaders will shortly be arriving in about December with a domestic abuse bill and domestic violence bill. It will now be an offence for anyone on a single domestic abuse or violence allegation to be treated by the law and also restorative justice. So we don't need to wait for a pattern of abuse and this will allow you as a system leader, as a clinician, to be able to work through this. And every organisation, go back and tell your organisations that when domestic violence bill comes out in December, your organisation will have to have a four-year plan in place to be an exemplar employer within two years. So a lot of the reforms coming out to protect citizens will have a direct impact. Obviously, adult safeguarding and children safeguarding will come on to that. Importantly for yourselves, CPIS, the Child Protection Information System in urgent care. We have been so successful at launching the alerts. For those that have never used it, every child in a protection plan or a court plan, every child who is looked after has an alert sent to the social worker when they attend urgent care. And we are now looking at phase two that I'll, I'll describe in a minute. We have a strategic role. Replace all of this with two simple slogans. It is our job in the National Safeguarding Team to make a reality out of a reform. It, that's our job. And the other job is to listen and make sure that you're engaged at the sharp end of safeguarding. So it's my job to safeguard the safeguarders. And we're beginning to bring resources into that so that you can do your job well, safely, and that you're safeguarded while you're doing that. Some of our achievements from last year, we'll skip over that because uh, um, we, we don't want to be braggarts, etc. It is absolutely uh, it would be remiss of me as a mental health nurse and you'll get a, a creative after this session. In order to deal with safeguarding, whether you're a champion, a clinician or a citizen, you must build your personal resilience. You have got to begin accepting that particularly around if you're in the perfect storm of work stress, Dealing with safeguarding, as we heard from Mark, you might miss it. And part of what my ask is of you is please go back to your organisations and have an honest conversation 
with your managers and your leaders and your directors of services and particularly your chief nurse and chief executive. Every one of us has been in the perfect storm of declining resilience. We're busy, we're occupied, more caseload, less resources. And when we're down in the decline of our everyday resilience, we do go into survival mode. That's natural. And in survival mode, we miss things. But also, in survival mode, that's when we become vulnerable as citizens to safeguarding moments. Horrible adults do nasty things to us if we display signs of survival mode. And we heard the, the prime example of in family, someone looking at the vulnerabilities. What we need as clinicians, carers and citizens is a move towards adaptive conversations. All the resources, all the policies, all the protocols, all the guidance in the world will not give you resilience if you cannot have a conversation in your workplace in order to rewire and take control of the conversations about the important issues that you have, your team has, your department has around safeguarding. Safeguarding is not going away. The fundamentals of safeguarding is the Human Rights Act, that we should all feel safe and competent and aspire as young people in transition to el old pe uh, adults and adult into elderly. And this is where I think we need to be going with you as clinicians, make you resilient. So where do you, where do you have your adaptive conversations? What sort of examples do you have? The lady in the middle there. Do you have an adaptive conversation in your workplace? An opportunity? Excellent. So there's speaking to a colleague and take it Take it at the coffee time as well, you know, out for a coffee. Treat each other. A little bit of kindness goes a long way. Random act of kindness goes a long way uh, when, when you're trying to speak to each other. The gentleman in the, the plaid shirt there. Yes. So regular team contact where, where, where nasty moments, horrible things are spoken about, yes? So, group conversations. Hands up those that have clinical supervision. Okay. Have you ever had a conversation in that about safeguarding? Yeah, excellent. Because some of this will get you into new habits. Now, one of, one of the things I heard about was be curious as a clinician. Ask the question, yes? I think asking the question is very important, but let me give you an example. I'm a midwife as well, as well as a mental health nurse. Strange career track. Okay. I was held hostage as a forensic mental health nurse, and I decided, what can I do that's safer than forensic mental health? <laughs> so I went to Arizona, that's in Tucson, uh, to train as a midwife and came back. So as a midwife. And one of the things that I was very clear with my colleagues was it's very difficult to ask the question when, as part of the maternity appointment, the perpetrator was sitting. Yes? Have we, have we been in that situation where the, where the victim is often escorted by someone and there's a real power there? And so what we did, rather than ask the question, which the, the, the pregnant woman was never alone, what we designed was the red dot on the urine pot, yes? There is only one thing that happens during a medical appointment or a nursing appointment, an assessment in maternity, where that woman is truly alone. I know there's a queue at the cubicles, but that's a moment. And so what we did was we put red dots in the toilet systems with a, a wee notice that says, if you are being abused but don't want to talk about it, please put a red dot on the bottom of your urine pot. And within the first week, six women did it. So there was never, are you being abused? I wasn't brave enough to ask a question with three people in the room, 
but we, we're, we're clinicians. We need to find a way in urgent care and other outpatient type departments and general practices of finding the solution. And in maternity, it was the red dot. Anyone use the red dot or the amber dot? Yes? A, a few acknowledgements. And that has proven dividends because it allows the person to tell you without disclosing it or disclosing it without telling you. And then you can take them and yourselves into recovery mode. The other thing we have to do, neither Kenny, the main man, Luke, yeah, really. <laughs> the, the first thing I, I learned in my new job, 153 days, is I, I cannot change society. And you, as a clinician, cannot bear responsibility for every nasty adult that does horrible things to either children, young people, etc. You, you're not responsible for that, and you're certainly not paid enough to be accountable for it. But the one thing we can do is we can raise a social movement. It's incumbent to us, under public health measures, for us to come out behind the intervention. So as a nurse, I have a, an interventionist model with my patient or the member of public. But as a system leader, I take a step back and I am a public health population nurse or clinician and carer. And so the, the one thing I've learned about public health is you've got to create a social movement. And that's what we do on social media. Hands up, hands up the twits in the room. Yes? Hands up the LinkedIn's in the room. Hands up the Instagram's in the room. You're putting your hand up and down an awful lot, madam. <laughs> As clinicians, whilst I absolutely get the tragedy of safeguarding using Tinterweb, as I call it, I've had to look at some horrid things happening on dark web as the head of safeguarding and make a judgment call as part of my role. I am absolutely adamant it has its positives. And let me give you an example. So we're all here today investing in our learning. We had the lived experience. We had a subject matter expert colleague. And can I applaud him for standing up in a room of peers and superiors and admitting that he's left with a regretful moment on the back of an error. Every one of us should applaud that. That's what true system leadership is about. Thank you. But... We, we, need, we need to know what we're learning from. And so what we've developed is a learning tool. This app is available, free. Even Aberdonian wouldn't charge you. It's all free. <laughs> and what you need to do is you need to take your... Uh, smartphone camera, focus on the NHS safeguarding app. Q it's called a QR code. Isn't technology wonderful? <laughs> you know, fabulous stuff. I'm going to have a T-shirt printed with it on, so when I come on stage, people's cameras go like that. <laughs> it feeds the imposter syndrome in Kenny. But yes, this... Oh, I've got imposter syndrome, just the same as you. NHS safeguarding is an app that will give you one for adults, one for children, one for colleagues as, as workers, with every contact you can ever imagine locally in the system leadership of safeguarding. But you know something? It's gone further. What we launched this, we launched this on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter. We launched it eight weeks ago. And we've gone from 150 times a day up to, hold on to your hat, 827,000, yeah. so 827,000, a bit of a bigger roar here, 827,000, <laughs> so 827,000 people have opened it, downloaded it, and possibly beginning to use it. Now, the reason I'm not telling you legislation is that each one of these is in fact 
a three-paragraph and a picture summary of the legislation. I'm not here to teach you to be subject matter experts in safeguarding legislation, level five. I'm here to give you insight to what is safeguarding, whether it's modern slavery, all 12, there are 12 lenses of safeguarding. And that, this will give you just that inspiration to think, what question do I need to ask? Am I worried about modern slavery? Am I worried about FGM? Am I worried about domestic abuse and violence? Am I worried about dark web exploitation? Am I worried about sexual assault and referral centres? Am I worried about sexual assault support centres? And there is a difference between the two of them. All of these systems and services have been set up, and this app, at your fingertips. But it goes further than that now. <laughs> what we've now done with an organisation called Multi-Agency App, because businesses, charities, and voluntary <coughs> sector. So there is a social worker called Caroline Flynn. She has set up something called Multi-Agency App, and she's now created key rings. <laughs> she's now created key rings that your team can hang on their, their office, office desks and say, if someone is asking for all the fabulous support charities, all you do with them, because everyone has one of these in their pockets, I can see you. And so the person takes it and they, they get linked straight into the peer support group. There is literally hundreds of decent, effective support groups. It's not for you to find the solution for that person's journey. It's for you to signpost them and give them the empowerment to contact someone that truly understands what they're going through. You've got a few of them at the back here. So the whole world of social media is, is hinging on this now. And we need you to embrace. Now, I know clinicians are scared about digital. I know that. But you know, it took us 600 years to go from plough to tractor. <laughs> it's taken us four years to go from analog phone to this. And we all use it. So we need to embrace the therapeutic value of support and peer support, particularly around the safeguarding app, okay? The other thing that we need to do is we need to make public health practitioners out of you. Who's up for the challenge? Because the new world, I'm sorry to say, is not general practice. That's fine. Your moment's gone. <laughs> because none of us go to GPs. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> My whole sexual health history is with a community provider. You know, so hands up the CCGs. Oh, well, hands Stand up the CCGs. <laughs> I, was, I was only going to get you to stand up because sitting is the new smoking. And if you stand up, it would, say, it would save you having deep vein thrombosis. So, so we, we've got to get system leadership. Clinicians, you need to understand that general practice and CCGs, they, they're having their moment, particularly around child protection and domestic homicide reviews and serious case reviews, because... The people in the CCG line, hand up again. Oh, hand up again. They're very timid. Hand up again. No, they're not. The, these, these people are now accountable for child protection systems along with the, the police commissioner, the police uh, constable, the chief constable, and the director of education. Hands up again. So... Uh, and these CCGs are now a triumphant around child protection, okay, and uh, child death reviews. And health will lead on every child death review, and lessons learned will come locally to region and up to my desk so that I can see what's happening with child death reviews. And when the Mental Capacity Act reforms are issued in February, there's a little thing called Brexit stopping these reforms coming out. In, in February, we'll be getting the mental capacity reforms. And again, letters, serious case reviews, see, uh, safeguarding adult reviews and mental health death reviews, they'll all come up 
through the CCG as recommendations and lessons there up to national so that we can cascade recommendations. So the, the, the tragic situation about these reviews for me is there are citizens losing their loved ones. They, so there's a grief process. They then come in to a review and they give their heart and soul to the review describing the loss and the impact on the family. And do you know what we do with that review? Any idea of what we do with the review? We put it on a shelf. The third layer of anger and disappointment happens to these families that like the independent inquiry, give their heart and soul at telling their story and nothing happens. That's all going to change with working together to safeguard children and it is likely to change with the Mental Capacity Act reforms. And you need to be familiar with that because data, information, will now be from June next year, a new flow of information will be coming to you called fingertips. Has anyone been in Public Health England's website called fingertips? PHE fingertips. Have a look at it. It contains all your primary care data as pseudonymized aggregated data based upon your postcode. So we know where all the diabetics are. We, all, we know where all the asthmatics are. But do you know something? We do not know where the safeguarding issues are. Why? Why don't we know where the safeguarding issues are? So what we've put in place is from April, the providers, the clinicians in the room will be delivering safeguarding data to us as 12 streams of data. It's totally anonymous. Unless it's a serious case review or a domestic homicide review, I don't know which citizens are affected. But that data, 12 bits of data, will then be handed to Public Health England to lay on fingertips so that we'll be able to, for the first time, tell which communities are impacted by domestic violence, honour killings, child protection issues, child safeguarding issues, modern slavery, FGM. And you will be able to target those with creative new solutions for the communities and populations and families you serve. Whilst you care for citizens, we have also got to restore confidence in communities, families, etc. So the whole digital platform is going to be cut in such a way that as system leaders, you'll be able to see it. And it goes further. Woo! You missed that one. It goes further. <laughs> From August next year, so we're going to lay all the safeguarding onto the health fingertips so that you've, you've got a really robust interpretation of your uh, uh, communities. Then the police force and community safety are going to give us their intelligence around community safety. Not policing, but community safety. So that for the first time, from about December next year, you'll have all the primary care prevalence, You'll have all the safeguarding and you'll have all the community safety data that allows you to make intelligent decisions about how you safeguard families and how you safeguard communities. Now that deserves a whoop whoop. So, <laughs> so it, it is about having listened to you because you don't know who the safeguarded families are. You don't know who the safeguarding families are. It's about giving you intelligent information that says as well as these laws and legislations, how can we best, what data do you need? What data do you need to make population decisions in your new integrated care systems? What data do you need to make a collective collaborative governance out within the CCG or with other partners? So that's all coming from April through December next year. Um, and in order to support that, we have proposed Hands up the people that manage budgets. Your hands up an awful lot of time. Mm. Yeah, that's okay. So CCGs and system leaders in the room, we're proposing a sequin. So uh, all NHS providers have a, a up to 2.5% uh, clinical quality innovation, uh, meritus payment, stretch, stretch payment that incentivizes stretch. 
what we're recommending is all of this reforms to reality stuff will take resources and transformation. And so therefore we're recommending, if you need it, a sequin, uh, commission of quality and innovation uh, incentive payment to acute providers, urgent care providers, community providers, everyone that deals with families. So I want to stop there and just see whether that was the type of reforms to reality you wanted. More than happy to take particular questions about specific reforms, because I spend a lot of time listening to parliamentary debate and making sense of that for you. And I know there's about 15 questions of commissioning type that Charlotte is pulling up. But uh, uh, we did want to remind you that obviously there is the intercollegiate documents. So if you leave, if you leave the subject matter uh, session before me, did you know listening to that is a level four experience? Listening to Mark and listening to the independent inquiry is a level four experience, if you reflect on it, for safeguarding. There is no greater moment of listen, believe, and do something than listening to a colleague or listening to a lived experience. That is level four. Provided you think, what will I change in my practice? And what, will, what have I learned most about me is what level four is. Most of us are working at level three. There is a uh, safeguarding adults came out in August. There's, con there's a little bit of a uh, concern about the 50% supervision but you're all telling me you've got groups, you're all telling me you're listening to each other. That's face-to-face. -face. You don't need to be in a formal face-to-face. -face. This is certainly face-to-face, -face, but I'm only a level three input. Mark and the colleagues before me, they were level four. This is level three, okay? Um, and the, uh, the adults came out in, in, in August, and the children's one, children and young people, it's coming out in December. Um, Edition 4 is coming out from the Royal College of Nursing in December about child protection, uh, etc., to, to align to the, the new reforms on child protection. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Kenny. Wow, you are the main man. You really are the main man. Thank you very much. And, 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 and that's the folks, folks that have know me and, and I'm, I'm really not one for what it says on your badge. I don't care what it says on your badge. That doesn't really matter. Mm. What matters is are you somebody that's going to make a difference? Uh, uh, and Kenny, you absolutely are making a difference and I, and I thank you for that. Thank you. Um, firstly, are there any questions from the floor? Can I gauge how many? So we've got one. Okay, just, just keep that. I will come to you, I promise. <laughs> Uh, can we bring a microphone to this gentleman so we can just prepare for that? So what information will be shared regarding sequin in safeguarding? So the sequin in safeguarding has 12 indicators, including the prevent referrals, the channel referrals, the LADO referrals. It's all the, the numbers that you gave to your CCGs as providers. So every time you report a safeguarding number, that's collected. At the moment, it's collected in a spreadsheet which we think is ridiculous. So the CCGs will be working with us to make it onto CDSC, which is the, the, the new portal that all providers are using for business as usual data. So it will just be a normal report for you that's collected and captured through the portal, the, the performance portal. It's going to be worth 1% of your contract value. And remember, 1% of a specialized contract value is a heck of a lot of money. 1% of a CCG contract value is still 1% of a community provider value. Some organisations don't get sequin, social enterprises may not get sequin, but we're going to find a way of incentivising the transformation. We've got to invest in transforming safeguarding to be business as usual, and it's everyone's business. And we can send you a copy of it, we'll send it in the pack as part of that question. Okay, just looking at what, what are the responsibilities of safeguarding leads? So there are, there are statutory responsibility. I'm a statutory responsibility to listen and affect change. Um, and uh, 
make comment, reforms to reality comments. There are, hands up the designated professionals. Hey, could you stand up? The designated <laughs> professionals. Up, up your, yeah, come on. Yes, please. Please, please. Can I yeah. just say that these individuals, whether they're designated professionals for children and or adults, they do one of the most incredible jobs you can imagine. These are your go-to local people. They know the local services, they know the local communities. They will give you advice if you have a safeguarding concern or anxiety. Designated professionals, a round of applause for them. <laughs> We've all, and CCGs will also have named nurses. They're employed by the services and there's always named nurses for looked after children and there's a growing, uh, a growing brigade of named nurses for adults at risk. We tend not to call them vulnerable adults uh, because the adults I've met, they're not vulnerable, believe me, they've got a voice, but they, they tend to refer to themselves as adults at risk. And for them, for anyone in the adult safeguarding arena, we're looking to bolster the, the Safeguarding Adult National Network to be a clinical reference group to the chief nurse. So we're trying to raise your voice to a roar. It is essential we hear you, and we're trying to raise that pitch and tone and content up to the roar level. Can we take this question from the floor, Hi, right, Kenny? Kenny, brilliant presentation, and I think your enthusiasm for safeguarding is amazing. Um, Alan and I, we lead the urgent care in Essex mm -hmm. and um, one of the things, just on a practical point that we, we face is that our GPs and our health, frontline healthcare staff find the referral forms really tedious yeah. and it would be amazing if we could just simplify it and yeah. then the safeguarding team then investigate and see if it is an issue. Yeah. Um, and I, I tried to do it myself for a GP who did do it and it took me about an hour to fill out the form and then we had to phone and then we had to not do this so there's some practical things i think we could take away so designate professionals amongst you i'm coming in to listen to the challenges there is absolutely nothing to stop us having a referral form that is a digital template on the clinical record system if we can refer a diabetic for an outpatient clinic or a 48 hour cancer wait appointment, we can refer a safeguarding using the same technology. We've landed men on the moon. We've even landed a, satel a satellite on an asteroid and taken a selfie. We will create. Yeah. Yeah. It was on three legs, if you remember. 442,000 miles. Away. We will make an e form for referral for children's and adult safeguarding, yeah. uh, probably by April. That's. Um... <laughs> And that, that reminds me of, of, of one of my favourite quotes, which, which you've heard me say before, and that's JFK in 1961. You know, we choose to go at the moon. We, yeah. we choose to go at the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's why we're going to do this together. Yes. And my favourite quote is JFDI. <laughs> yeah. we'll, so we'll we'll JFDI we, that one. We'll just take one more um, question, Kenny. Maybe it's this one, because, you know, we're... We're here today putting yes. on a training event. Right. So we are. let's take this. So by <coughs> reflecting on this event, you, you will absolutely categorically have level three. This is face to face. It's absolutely heart and soul level three. For some of you who are system leaders, it could be level four. If you reflected the lived experience I had today in your continued professional development, whether you're the midwife, whether you're the, the care assistant, whether you're the ambulance team at the top, whether you're agency workers, you will, you will have reflected at level four with such a subject matter expert. Mm. Don't mm. be afraid of, of training being a learning experience. You, you've got to look at it as a learning experience rather than coming to this to be trained. Yeah. And how, how do you think we get more people to come to these events? Because that was part of that question. And you put it out there on social media. I've been following yeah. you all on Twitter, and there's a lot of activity going on there already yes. today. I, I think learning won't happen here. Hashtags are very important. You know, 800 and 860,000 people have downloaded our app. They're all learning as they download mm. the app and, and reading something about local contacts. Uh, I think you have to remember that not everyone could be lucky enough to come to this beautiful building, isn't it? I mean, it deserves a round of applause. <laughs> um, For a building? Um, and uh, 
I think learning happens outside the space. I certainly know I've been tracking hashtag it's, it's not hidden and there are 54 people outside this space participating mm. as we speak because they're looking mm. in at the tweets and looking in at these sentences and we're yeah. So we've got to create a learning culture, a community of practice is what safeguarding needs. Yeah. And, and that's another take home for, for today yeah. about yeah. creating a community of practice around urgent care and around safeguarding. And, and tweet about the app. The, the more people that download, I've just downloaded it, it's a good app. Yeah, uh, yeah it, it, it honestly is, and that's... And the, the, yeah. app will change, the app will change every three months. We also have a trusted list of go-to resources. It's critical, as our colleagues at the Independent Inquiry say, you've got to have trusted resources for safeguarding. So we've got a new Quality Assured trusted list of resources. We'll send that to you. That's monthly. You know, and the new web page will be up and running. We will feed you information about all matters safeguarding because, and I go back to this thing, you're here as a clinician, but you need to learn as a citizen to change societal values. It's nothing mm. to be ashamed of to talk about safeguarding moments. So let's raise that voice and get cultural change. So, Thank you. let's have a big whoop whoop! <laughs> whoop! <laughs>